The Angdokyo is brought to you by media partners GMA Network, ABS-CBN, Rappler, Inquirer.net, Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism, and Probe Productions. Tonight's show is co-presented and will be cross-posted by Engaged Media, Pelico Love, Rappler, ANCX, and the University of the Philippines Film Institute. So, ano po pag-uusapan natin? Pag-uusapan natin today, the state of journalism in the Philippines as a journalist, and I speak for myself, although actually, no, I speak for all of us. I'm pretty confident in saying this. We're in crisis. We're, we're, we are all in crisis. The press, journalism, uh, media in the Philippines is in crisis. Uh, probably one of the fairest things you can say, on the other hand, is, yeah, but we've always been in crisis. Uh, so this is not necessarily just to attribute to one regime or one moment in time, but there's a lot of the realities that exist that have always been there. A crisis of relevance, a crisis of freedom, as we said, a crisis of trade where news is molded in the strange new world of analytics, formats, platforms. And if you think that's not driving us up the wall, there is a crisis in society where delivering the news has become a battlefield where you face network shutdowns, cyber libel, confiscations, misogyny, and too many dead journalists, journalists in its way. And then on top of all of that, there's this. Ninyong franchise mag-end next year. If you are expecting na marinyo yan, I'm sorry. You're out. I will see to it that you're out. Press freedom. Press freedom. Kayo yung number one magnanakaw. Ayaw niyo sa uli yung propiedad. Press freedom. Inquirer, you've never been fair. I know that it's supposed to be antagonistic, but fair. Bastos kayo, pati ABS. Tang ina itong time magasena to. Nilagay ako doon sa mga despot na. Hindi naman ako doon. Ba't the dictador ba ako? Since when? Since when did I send somebody to prison for just talking against me? Hindi na. Kasama lang yan ang kapilyuhan niya. <laughs> Sabi naman ng mga fellow bedans, talagang pilyo yan. Just because you have the power of uh, what? Press freedom. The issue here is not press freedom. The way your masters, the elite, yung may-ari niyan. And you are not even constitutionally allowed to go into the media. With the pretext of ano yung depository. What kind of a salam of bitch is that? Kaya ako mamatay, mahudo yung aeroplano, putang ina. I am very happy. Alam mo bakit? Sabi ko, without declaring martial law, I dismantle the oligarchy that controls the economy of the Filipino people. Yung muka kayong pera, kakapalang muka ninyo, kayong taga-media. You know, you want to know my sentiments? Fuck you. So welcome po to our Reality Check series. Once again po, ako po si Robby Alampay of Signal TV, specifically of the One News Channel. I'm also with the Puma Podcast Group. And we're here to talk about the state of journalism in the Philippines. Our guests tonight and the organizations they belong to have experienced all the problems, all the charges that we've talked about. Siguro kung kumpunihin natin lahat ng legal fees nila, we don't know how much dolomite we can buy for Manila Bay, how many PRC tests we can buy for Filipinos. Meet some of our country's bravest truth frontliners. Jing Reyes, head of the Integrated News and Current Affairs of ABS-CBN Corporation. Siya po yung nakita natin sa Kongreso. Maria Reza, siya yung nakita natin sa kung ano-anong korte. CEO, Executive Editor of Rappler. John Neri, columnist of the Philippine Daily Inquirer, Chairman of the Board of the Asian Center for Journalism at Ateneo. And then Sheila Cornell, Ramon Magsaysay Award lang naman po, Director of the Tony Stabil Center for Investigative Journalism and a professor at Columbia Journalism School. And sasama na rin po natin dito, kasama natin one of the veteran senior journalists of the Philippines from the Associated Press, Mr. 
Jim Gomez. Okay, so we'll dive straight into our conversation. Conversation to, ah. We're all among friends. Feel free to take me out of this conversation and just carry on the conversation on your own. I want to start with you, Sheila, kung, kung okay lang. Sheila, we're talking about press freedom, the state of journalism in the Philippines, reality check, and title sa series na to. Let's start with the reality check. Sheila, do you really think may pakialam yung mga Pilipino sa pag-uusapan natin? Do you really think that outside of the choir that's watching us right now and the students that have been required to watch in on this Zoom link, do you really think that the rest of the Filipinos actually care? I think they do. Um, you know, I started my journalism career during the Marcos era, and I was working for the, for the Manila Bulletin, which was Marcos controlled press. And I remember after the Aquino assassination, there was such massive anger about the suppression of press freedom. There were pickets, my friends were picketing our office outside, you know, and when I would go to the rallies, people would shout at me, tell the truth, tell the truth, because they knew the truth was suppressed. There has historically been very strong support for press freedom in the Philippines. Our founding fathers, if you can call them that, were journalists. They knew the power of the written word. And up to now, there is still this expectation that journalists will stand up to power. And there is vast public support for the role of journalists as not just as chroniclers of what's happening, but as watchdogs who hold powerful individuals and institutions to account. So I remain, I have deep faith in, you know, this intrinsic and long-standing belief of Filipinos. You know, we, we've seen it throughout our history, the Second World War, the Marcos era, all the periods of repression, Filipinos have hankered to not just write the truth, but to hear about the truth. Yes, but Sheila, I mean, and I, I want to invite everybody here in this, in this conversation, but Sheila, you're citing people power. You're citing the 1980s. In the meantime, Maria's gotten arrested how many times? ABS-CBN was taken off the air just this past month. Where's the rally? Where is the outrage? I mean, yes, there were people who picketed. There were people who went out. Never mind COVID. But where is the outrage? Do you really feel it? Well, I'm, I'm not in the Philippines at the moment. But I think at least hmm. from, from the, what, what I've seen on social media and what I hear from my friends and the family, there is outrage, but it's not the kind of outrage that is spilling out into the streets. It is, um, so we, sh we should distinguish, you know, I know that the president has vast support, but we should distinguish between that and the support for what he's doing to the media. If you ask the ordinary Filipino, do they want more choices in what they're reading, hearing, watching on TV? Mm. What would the answer be? I'm sure the answer would be yes. I don't think any Filipino would say, no, I just want one version of the truth. I just want the mm. government's version. Otherwise, Channel 4 would, would, would be the runaway um, TV station, right? Mm. People mm. want a plurality of voices, and they're not getting that in this current media, in this current media landscape. Okay. I mean, Jing, I mean, everybody knows about what happened to ABS-CBN. Maria, we've all been following um, uh, everything that's been going on with Rappler. Uh, I've always said it outright. I mean, it's, it's very, very clear. The president has it in for Maria Reza and Rappler. He has it in for the Inquirer. He's targeted journalists. But Jing and Maria specifically, tell me, did you feel it? How did you feel it? And is there a part of you that's, that's, that's you know, somewhat wondering then if there is support, is there outrage enough to actually believe that there's something that I should be I don't know, marching for, fighting for, in whatever form. Jing? Um, you know, Robbie, I think uh, our fate in the hands of the NTC and later on the Congress uh, became a rallying point or a rallying cry for press freedom. And for the first time in a long time, uh, the mass audience was able to relate to it. Mm. Uh, they had an appreciation and an understanding of why we were shut down, for instance. You can see that in their comments on social media. You can see that in their feedback that they give to us uh, in our shows and uh, you know the direct calls or text messages 
that they send to our programs. Mm. I think there is support for freedom and for freedom of choice when it comes to news content and even entertainment content. It's just that people are also concerned with, I think, more basic things, more to them, more essential mm. uh, things in their lives right now, especially with this pandemic. Um, there is, uh, mm. we saw people, you know, join the noise barrage around ABS-CBN uh, every Friday beginning, uh, I think around the time that the franchise hearings were being held. Mm. Uh, and before that, before the lockdown, there were really big crowds along Sergeant Esquera Avenue in Quezon City. Um, I guess it's a, it, it was a, a, a function of timing, a uh, fear of COVID, as well as, you know, people think still no, not that um, the problem of press freedom is, uh, is something that maybe others would fight mm. for, or maybe the media uh, practitioners and the journalists have, uh, have, are in a better position to fight for. Parang ganun yung prevailing mm. uh, sentiment sa nababasa namin sa ngayon. Mm. But they Ay. are concerned and there mm. is outrage. It's just that it's not enough for a massive uh, turnout on the streets. Yeah, but, yeah but, but why not? I mean, like, as Sheena said, we stopped the country. We stopped, we stopped not just the government. We stopped all business in this country to bring back democracy. And maybe that's maybe that's a function of having really really lost it, right? Maybe it's one thing to I know it's a, it's another thing to be surrounded by this cacophony all around us and say, well, mukang namang nanjam pang GMA, mukang nanjam pang rapper, nanjam pang inquirer, sa totoo lang naman, totoo naman nakikita ko parin naman lahat to. And so on. so and Maria, the why, where is the disconnect, Maria? Uh, where do you think is the, the, the disconnect? Uh, because I do I do wanna believe that there is sympathy on the one hand at the same time there is a real value behind it and there's really something foundational for filipinos but where is that disconnect uh i think first you, look the reality is we live in an environment of violence and fear right that's the first then you add covid on top of that you know probably the uh, one of the long the world's longest lockdown and certainly uh one of the most security driven along with uh, Bolsonaro, Brazil and the Philippines, right? Uh, our, our pandemic response was, uh, was, was led by retired military generals largely. So people know that there are costs to standing up. Uh, mm. And if it isn't the government, if you're not one of the 100,000 plus arrested mm. uh, for quarantine violations or worse, uh, you you then can get COVID-19, right? So uh, the costs are high. Uh, the timing is perfect for shutting down ABS-CBN, right? It, the conditions of martial law are there without declaring martial law. Uh, and then I think the third thing is that, and we don't, I'm, you know, I talk about this all the time. It's really the fact that our information ecosystem is turned upside down. And that is it, that, 100% of Filipinos on the internet are on Facebook. That, that social media, which has become a behavior modification system, is where Filipinos get their news. And that's, you know, I'm sure we're going to talk about the surveys that are coming up, but this distorts mm. everything because uh, social media actually changes the way you think and the way you act. Mm. It is passive, okay. like advertising, right? So. Yeah, and that's that's fair, right? I mean, all exterta all externalities factored in. Maybe I've been brainwashed, right? I mean, that's that's a reality. But John, I mean, we're talking about fear. We're talking about social media really rewiring our brains to the detriment of our own of our own interests. But you mentioned surveys, Maria. I precisely was going there. Part of the reason I asked this was also look. Approval ratings and trust ratings for media is what, 40%, 60%? Right? In the meantime, approval rating for President Duterte is 91%. I mean, is there anything there that you would 
qualify or outright deny that approval for this uh, for this government that we do see as an as 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 uh, detrimental to press freedom is very high, and then trust for media is really let's face it uh, really appalling. I mean, so so John, is there? There may be a value there. There may be a sympathy, but do you think that may have something to do with kung saan tayo nabibitin? Well, uh, I'm the only opinion journalist in this panel, uh, so I feel even more like an imposter. Having said that, I will inflict my opinion uh, on this forum. Um, the real disconnect, Robbie, is in using a framework that no longer applies. It's old generals uh, fighting the old war. Um, has there been outrage? Yes, of course, there has been outrage. Uh, I was uh, at the uh, Friday rallies in ABS-CBN before and at the start of the pandemic. And I have to tell you, it was growing every Friday. Uh, and at a certain point when the stars came out, I mean, it was just nothing like EDSA yet. It was growing. And then the pandemic you know, really hit us hard the middle of March. So that, that was one thing. Uh, when ABS-CBN uh, uh, was shut down uh, May 5 and then July 13, uh, the uh, uh, franchise was, was rejected, there was an outpouring also of outrage on uh, social media. There, there are many ways to gauge outrage. One of them would be how many people signed up to be volunteers for mm. the people's initiative for a... Uh, 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 franchise for uh, ABS, and I, as mm. I understand, in 24 hours they got 10,000 plus volunteers. So mm. you know there are, there are many things. But going back to the current question about surveys, yes, it is true that the president has 91 percent uh, approval rating, but it is also true that all the surveys since he came on board show that uh, majority of Filipinos don't want suspects to be killed about 90%, about the same, uh, about 75% of Filipinos uh, say they uh, are afraid that they or someone they know will be the next victim of an extrajudicial killing. Uh, less than 10% of uh, survey respondents say that they believe 100% uh, definitely that the police do everything uh, and can and, and kill only pag may nanlaban, all right? Mm. So, it's not enough for us to just point at one number and say, oh, 91%, and that excuses everything. No, the same surveys also show that a majority of Filipinos, around 50-something, 50 52 54%, know that the media is under pressure, under Duterte. So mm. it, it's, it's a complicated thing. Uh, mm. um, in, a way, in a way, what's holding back the opposition is their dependence on surveys. Uh, I know I started by talking about using false analogies, but we, when we go back to the Marco, anti-Marco struggle, we didn't contend with surveys. We just did the right thing, right? Mm. Now you have politicians saying, what's the weather like? It cannot be like that, right? So I mean, that's also part of the reason why uh, the outrage has sort of simmered down. Aside from the pandemic, there's also a sort of political cal calculation that comes in that wasn't there 30 years ago. Uh, so yeah, let's look inwards. Let's talk about journalists per se. Jim Gomez, um, and I'll throw everybody who's been covering, who's been covering and been journalists for, for decades. Are we scared? I mean, Jim, I mean, not just, not just for this panel, but for, for journalists in general, especially the young people, um, even veterans for, for that matter. How, how would you answer that? Are, are, Filipinos, are Filipinos scared at this point? Hey, you, you earlier question, Mo, Robbie, no? you you know, if you if you look around, and it's you know it's our job to to really write down what's happening every time in this country. Uh, you know, you know you see what's happening to Maria. You know, like a station of the cross, you know, tragic closure of ABS ABN, um, and and you know that the what what you see, you know, the persona of this president. So, for a foreigner, you know, you you. It's easy to outsider, outsider, outsiders of, in this country. You, it's easy to get lost in the Philippine story. Uh, the dynamics are so complicated, and uh, you know it's it's not it's it's not it's not easy to understand this uh, 
this uh, authoritarian you know populism that hit us no so we we've seen a preview of what happened in Davao no? 1000 dead and still he got 16 million more than 16 million votes in 2016 no so so i think there's there's a there's a window here for our you know universities political scientists to to look into so we'll we'll understand the the mindset, the, the public's uh, perception of their leaders, how they make their choices. And, you know, we're in two, in two years, we're going to another national election. So mm. it's, it's, it's really uh, crucial for, for us to understand what is happening. There's, I think there's no one answer to this. We journalists will be better armed if we understand the, these political dynamics. Mm. Okay, A anybody else? Are we are we scared? Do you do you? I mean, we talk about chilling effect. Let's spell it out. You know, para akatapot, di ba? But is there? Are we scared? I mean, are your reporters scared? Are your are are the people uh, staying out of the journalism program? If they are in the journalism program, why would they want to be in the journalism program? But I mean, that's that's a basic question. Are we in fact scared? I always say this when I'm, I'm speaking, as, as Jim pointed out, when I'm speaking with foreigners. I always tell them when you come to the Philippines and you see the cacophony of, of coverage and you look at social media and how ribald and how aggressive netizens can be, it's really very hard to make that argument that that there, that people are afraid in the Philippines and going to your point, Sheila, they are quite brave. Right? So therefore, how do you answer that question that are people in fact getting cowed? Um, I'll jump in really quickly here. You know, uh, it's meant to scare you. It's meant to intimidate you. But frankly, the impact on me is I'm angry. I mean, you know, I've never had by next year, I'll have been a journalist for 35 years. We're all roughly, we all came of age at about the same time, Diva. And I have, and I've covered in, in many countries around the world. I, it, this time period is one of a kind and our, the Duterte administration is one of a kind. Um, I certainly hope like the pandemic, it's once every hundred years, but <laughs> you know, I guess what, where it comes to me is anger is a, is a reaction to, to show you how difficult it is to do our jobs. These are the consequences of doing our jobs. I mean, literally I have eight criminal cases uh, and those charges cumulatively uh, are almost a hundred years, even though there's that clause that says, oh, I could only, that I could be compressed to 40 some odd years. I shouldn't, a journalist shouldn't have to deal with things like that, right? So anyway, I'll shut up because I want to hear also, right? Can I, can I say something? Yeah. I think it's the government that's afraid. I mean, you, you have a government that's very strong, that has the military and the police under its command, and it's clamping mm. down these young reporters, a trapper. Mm. I mean, that is such an asymmetrical battle. It's it's threatening the publishers of newspapers. It's closed down the largest TV network. That Those are actions of fear, not strength. Mm. Why are they afraid? Because they are afraid that the truth will come out. Mm. They are afraid that you know the watchdog tradition in the Philippine media would assert itself. They are afraid that all the corruption and abuses that are happening in this regime are going to be exposed. It's the government that's afraid. It's it's so, I, I, I think to say that citizens are fair, some of them are for sure, but I think the government is even more fearful. This mm. government is afraid it will be held to account when mm. there's a new government that is in power that is not friendly to them. Can I ask you a question, Sheila? I mean, as, as former director, as a founder of PCIJ, as a teacher of journalism, you, you, you mentioned uh, uh, um, being taken to account because this is a question I wanted to ask later on. But when you imagine a post-Duterte administration, and like I said, look, we've always been in crisis. We faced ERAP, we had Marcos, uh, GMA, everybody brought something to the table in terms of reminding us that eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. Okay, all of that. Right? But Duterte, as people say, ibang klase. But speaking of uh, holding them to account 
and the current climate. How do you imagine the climate in the post Duterte, from day one of post Duterte? What do you see happening? Is there suddenly going to be a dam burst uh, of coverage uh, of certain areas? What, what kinds of projects do you want to see? Not out of spite, or not out of, but genuinely as a news person thinking, these are the things that are inevitably going to be covered. I think a lot depends on who's going to take over after Duterte mm -hmm. and what kinds of policies that new president is going to implement. Mm -hmm. um, but we've really had, you know, lo looking at the recent past, you've had the Aquino government holding, you know, Chief Justice Corona and the ombudsman who was appointed by mm -hmm. um, President Arroyo, you know, you had that. And then you had Duterte doing the same thing to, to Laila de Lima. So mm -hmm. I see that there's going to be a similar pattern if there's a different government that's going to be in power. But I think without the restraints, I think, I think in some cases that the dam will burst because there are people not just in the media, but also in the opposition and people who've been, you know, mm -hmm. who've been targeted as well as, as genuine citizens who want to hold I, I still have faith that some of our institutions are going to work, that mm. we can still assert the independence of the accountability institutions, such as the courts, mm. the office of the ombudsman, et cetera, et cetera. I think uh, there's also the international um, piece to think about. Um, there's the International Criminal Court. There are sanctions currently on police officers. And I think as, as, the, as people feel freer to talk, there will be there will be more cases filed. I mean, thousands yes. of victims were killed in the uh, drug war. Yeah. So, yeah, but but let me just say, it's not just for the, for the drug war victims. It's not just accountability. There has to be reconciliation within those communities because those communities have been divided <clears throat> by yeah. this piece and there and, has to be a real effort to reconcile you know yeah and, and not sectors. just yeah. not just healing and reconciliation and yeah. justice the reality is as mentioned kanina somebody touched on it we do have to make that connection on what press freedom and independent media brings mm -hmm. literally to the table of filipinos diba? Mm -hmm. make it make it clear that you know my, there is a, a utilitarian and a real value to you having your democracy and press freedom. Yes, pwedeng kainin ng demokrasya, but that's very hard to, to communicate. But I, natawa lang ako, Sheila, because you said you, you put your faith in the institutions. And we have institutions that certainly need mending, and we put our faith there as well. But very often, the politics and the realities of government here in the Philippines, it always goes back to personalities. It always goes back to the sophistication and savviness and shallowness or depth of our leaders. Eh, kanina nag-uusap kami ni Jing. And I wanted to get your reaction, di ba, Jing? Because last week, uh, Congressman Eric Yap, in a conversation with um, Christian Esguera, Marshall McLuhan Fellow for 2020, was interviewing Eric Yap. And Eric Yap said, with a very straight face, and I would like to allow, the, in all sincerity, said, balang araw magpapasalamat ang ABS-CBN sa ginawa namin. No? And balang araw, ABS-CBN will become better and probably even better than CNN. And then they will understand why we needed to do why, what we needed to, to do. My question to Jing and my question to you, John, and to all of you. Hmm. That's his sense the, of people behind, the people behind our institutions, do you think they understand what they're talking about? Like, do you think, I mean, I, I mean, I ask this in all sincerity, do you think that they really understand press freedom? When they say, for example, I believe in press freedom, pero galingan niyo muna. Uh, or I believe in press freedom, pero be responsible naman. And then I will grant you this. Or not just press freedom, human rights. I believe in human rights, pero human rights din ang hindi ma-rape ang anak ko sa ano, kaya therefore, o kaya ano. Do, do you think naiintindihan nila yung sinasabi nila? Rob, I if, if I may, uh, uh, and I, I lead to Jing. No? Uh, the uh, I, I think what Eric, Eric Yap said was uh, out of a sense of guilt. I mean, that is the way they're justifying what they did. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to speak to something that you raised earlier when you characterized uh, our history as a series of crises. 
Uh, mm. Yes, that is true. But I think it is a fundamental mistake to consider this administration mm. as just another administration. Mm. Uh, she, uh, Maria was talking about maybe you know it happens on every hundred years. I think it happens every thirty years. Now we are we are actually uh, facing the prospects of an authoritarian regime. So mm. you know, Arab was 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 a terrible president, uh, uh, convicted of plunder, ousted from office, but he he didn't have a dictatorship in mind. Unlike Duterte, who is ne he's not shy about uh, his intentions, or Marcos. So I think it is incumbent on us as journalists not to normalize what they're doing. We, we cannot just say, well, you know, it's always like this. Mm. It isn't. Maybe mm. it's like, uh, the, you know, every 30 years we have the locusts. Mm. But anyway, mm. to go back, yeah, go to, to, go back to, to Jing, I really think I agree with her with what she said earlier that... Uh, in fact, I think that years from now, the followers of Duterte will regret what they did to ABS. I think that that was the moment when press freedom became a bread and butter issue. I, I think that that's I think that I think that's what went dark. No, but I think that's what we I, I, I think we all know what we're saying. But I want to bring it back to my question because I, I mean it. I, I want to be charitable to mm -hmm. Congressman Yap. I, not to date myself, but I, I, I want to think that this is a young congressman, certainly younger than me. It takes a lot of chutzpah, but also I would think naivete, but also I would think I would grant innocence, maybe even sincerity when he says that, because really it takes a lot to say something like that to an ABS-CBN uh, anchor, right? but Yun tanong ko sa yo, Jing eh, parang, and, and to you, Jim, because as I said, the institutions always redound at the end of the day to, eh, sino bang nakaupo dyan? And, and I have a real nagging feeling that people actually, we inherited the press freedom, we inherited the democracy and the human rights, but we never really internalized it. We never really understood what, what it meant. And those are the people who were behind that vote for ABS-CBN. What do you think, Jay? Well, well, believe me, I, I felt that uh, I was in that same quandary while I was in Congress uh, a few months back because I was explaining how we did our jobs and yet uh, the lawmakers who were there at that time seemed to have been uh, oblivious to, to the workings, the inner workings of journalists. Uh, and to say that, yes, we understand press freedom and we support press freedom, but uh, be responsible. In most uh, cases, it's just code for saying, yes, I like press freedom as long as you don't uh, report unfavorably about me. Mm. Uh, most of the time, it is the case uh, with, with people in power. Uh, and, uh, you know, ABS, CBN, Inquirer, Rappler, and all the other news outlets have offended one way or another many of those who are uh, in power now and, and before. And yet this time, somehow, uh, it's different. You know, ordinary politicians would let uh, an unfavorable coverage or even a tough interview slide after a while, right? But yeah. these days, that doesn't happen anymore. We get uh, recurring, you know, uh, statements, attacks, uh, yeah. calling us out for alleged bias or uh, unfairness or uh, accusing us, our journalists, of being on the take just because uh, questions that were asked of them in some interviews were tough yeah. or, you know, weren't really gentle enough or some sort of, uh, you know, uh, allegation that they were not allowed to give their side, et cetera, et cetera. So some of these people behind our powerful institutions do understand what press freedom is. And yet they choose to demonize media for reasons that are self-serving, obviously. But then yes, it's also true, Robbie, that there are younger, impressionable young men and women who might believe what, mm -hmm. uh, what they see or what they mm -hmm. hear from, 
from more, uh, you know, sinister minds yeah. uh, about yeah. how media should be discredited. Mm, yeah, that's part of the reason why I ask also. It's not just about the people in the institutions, not just our leaders, not mm -hmm. just our legislators, but the people watching. Because if somebody says, Diba? I'll give you your press freedom. Kalingan nyo lang. There are young people who will say, well, that sounds reasonable. I don't, I don't see anything objectionable there. But Jim, I want to ask you, you've seen a lot. I mean, we've been talking about a lot of things. You've seen a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, may bago pa dito sa pinag-uusapan natin? I mean, in these particular times, and what is different? And I want to ask Sheila also, what is different about these days? Let's say, compare it to era. Mm, no, but Obviously, but, but by no means that this is new, no? it's something new. We've seen this. I, I, I covered the twilight years of uh, Ferdinand Marcos in, in the Inquirer. Uh, so then this has happened, you know, and you were talking of reality checks. You know, I, I think we, we, we have had so much reality checks, you know, bloody, deadly reality checks. I think we have one too many monuments and shrines, you know, for massacres and 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 these bad events. No? So and I want to go back briefly to your question about the surveys. Uh, as a journalist, and we've been monitoring this very religiously, uh, I was really thinking that it was really unbelievable for somebody so far out of the box to be like in the 60s, 70s percent. I was thinking there should be an element of intimidation in those surveys. Mm. But, you know, because you know how, how they are done. They knock on the door, they ask your name. They, why would you, what would you answer when, when you are asked if, if you know, if, if you're uh, fine with the president? Right? So, mm. and, uh, but, you know, uh, I was watching for the, the next chance of a secret way of, pulsing the people no? and th that was the midterm elections and and we all know the results the the opposition was completely wiped out in the senatorial mm. race that hasn't mm. happened in a long long time in the philippines not one opposition candidate mm. but you know i also uh, agree with sheila that th th there's really an element of uh, uh, fear on, on the side of the government, you know, the, the personalities, and uh, you you can almost feel the the you know the legal preparations, the prepping up, mm. the the withdrawal from the ICC, and you know uh, I was able to like Sheila and many of us here were I was able to cover the the tail end and the overthrow in '86 and what happened after it was a busy busy time, you know, moment of reckoning, and uh, yeah. I, I think we may see that happening again after 2022, whoever wins, whether his side or the opposition side or anybody. Yes, he, he's okay. one of a class. Okay. Sheila, let's, let's bring it back. Manila Times, in the time of era, putting the squeeze on the owners, putting the squeeze on advertisers, and so on. Very overt, and everybody saw it coming a mile away. It was very, very overt. Um, what's different now? What, what's different is that there is a systematic campaign to create disinformation and propaganda in mm. favor of the government, <clears throat> mainly using social media, but also if you listen to, to radio and that filtering out to the mainstream. And let me just say, this is not unusual. The Philippines is by no means the only country where this is happening. This is a global trend. The assault on truth and on democracy is a global thing. And certainly Duterte benefits from that global populist moment in mm. terms of, you know, he's, he's able, you know, there's no much, not much repercussion internationally, but he's also using tactics that have been used elsewhere in Russia, in China, and in, and in other countries. So <clears throat> I, I, that is what's new. It's the flood. It used to be that the tactic was to curtail information that was disadvantageous to the government or to the powers that be. In the current landscape, the tactic is to flood um, media, including social media, mainstream media, with disinformation. So it's no longer constricting, but flooding. So that, that, is, that is the main, main difference. Let me just address Congressman Yap. I think this comes from a very macho kind of thinking. 
you know, right. you have to be disciplined. It's also of a piece with, with Duterte's thinking. You're bad, you have to be disciplined, we have to spank you. It's this very patriarchal mm. way in which uh, our, our leaders think, you know, that you discipline people by using the iron hand. Mm. It's, it's, it's not a democratic way of thinking, but it's very inherent in, in a sort of macho Filipino political culture. And so that, that's, how I, that's how I see it. Yeah. Okay. I, that, I, I, go ahead, Maria. Of, of, uh, of that is that he is young, right? And, you know, yeah. what we see there is actually uh, somebody who shows uh, ignorance and arrogance, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a bit shocking. And what happened to ABS-CBN is gaslighting at any level, right? Mm -hmm. Make them afraid of uh, the past wrongs that may, they may or may not have done. That wasn't the point. So again, it's misdirection. I mean, it's so interesting. Everything comes down to power and money. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've seen play out. Um, what in the environment Sheila laid out, which is an environment of lies. I mean, Russian military, the, the phrase they use is uh, the fire hose of falsehoods, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a military tactic. It's part of their military doctrine. They, when it's seated on social media, when a leader lies so many times, the journalists are running around, running after, trying to fact check every lie. This happens in the U.S., right? I think mm -hmm. this is, you know, mm -hmm. in the sense of you know, the fact check happens. But if the lie happens every so frequently, the fact checks don't matter. And it changes the fire, the fire hose of lies changes your reality. It makes the the people more docile because you have no idea uh, mm. what really is truth, right? And mm. that's and that's what happened with the uh, franchise hearings, Maria. Exactly. Uh, we, we presented evidence, and yet uh, what prevailed was the Congress's version of mm. fact, right. Uh, yeah. The case of ABS-CBN has seen all the the whole gamut of you know, mm. this information, gaslighting, demonization, et cetera. So, and yeah. here we are, that's the biggest difference, mm. Robbie. We have social media now, we have mm. this very potent tool for spreading this information that was not in existence during the time of Marcos or Era or Gloria Arroyo. Yeah, okay, speaking of gaslighting, um, I, as you said, one of the things that uh, they did with ABS-CBN was to say, after asking about BIR obligations, SEC, NTC, all the regulators said, no, wala kasalanan yan. At the end of the day, and then this is about oligarchies. We're breaking up um, oligarchies. And that was the gaslighting, the ultimate gaslighting there. But I do want to bring up, therefore, on the point of oligarchy, something that is not new, something is very old, something that I've always felt has always been the Achilles heel of media in the Philippines. And that's ownership, right? Ownership has always been the, a vulnerability for all of us. You have the Prietos with the Inquirer. Uh, you have uh, the Lopezes of ABS-CBN. I come from uh, at TV5 and Signal, um, MVP group. A lot of regulated industries there. Maria, never mind Omidyar, never mind all. But the people in your board who invested and so on, they're all businessmen. They're all thinking of their investments. And this is an old trick. How do we address this Aquila seal? I mean, it's always going to be exposed. On the other hand, uh, when you go to the other end of the spectrum, where you have very small independent media trying to make it on their own, uh, no ownership issues uh, outside of their, their small media. Yeah, but then they don't have the audience. But it's in the big players that I want to ask. How do we not fix? It's just a reality, right? But how do we take that reality given that time and again with every administration, not just this administration, ownership has always been the target and the Achilles heel. Um, in sorry, the sorry, Robbie, I have to correct you on that. I mean, in the sense that uh, in Rappler, the journalists, uh, we control it. I mean, in the okay. sense that we own the most shares as a, mm. as a whole. And then the other part of it is, I think that ownership isn't always the Achilles heel. I mean, it can be an excuse. It can be an excuse for the propaganda. 
business can at, at least in terms of the tactics of what of the attack on the media right now the attack is led by by the law and by the BIR <laughs> right if you look mm. at the way we are all being attacked and that is not about one family or even ownership it really is a different time mm. um I am not an oligarch, and yet social media says I am, right? I mean, that's why I, I, the reason I challenge that is because uh, the ownership of Rappler, it, it's the journalists who control it, and yet we're under attack as well. I, I think this is about uh, uh, a clamp down on media. This is what it is. It is, there, there isn't really anything, like there's nothing that any journalist here can do any better or any worse, it will still be. Sorry, mm. I'll shut up. No, 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 I mean, all, 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 all points uh, well taken. But my point is just the strategy. I'm not. To say, it's not to say that this is the reality. It's just to say that they did use ownership. They did throw it in there. They did use it as an excuse, if that's how you want to look at it. But that is an opening that they will overly exploit. If there's no opening, they will invent the opening. I guess that's the that's the point, right? Yeah. But mm -hmm. but but Jing, I mean the context here is, for example, with the Lopez. Everybody said, okay, okay, lang yan, kasi pagkawala na yung airtime and nasa digital na and hindi na regulated yung 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 uh, yung franchise nyo. Okay, yeah, mag, pwede nang pwede nang magsalita ang mga taga ABS-CBN. But the, uh, the message was very clear before they, they put the, before they put down the gavel. They said, "Di pa tapos, kasi yung Lopez's oligarchy ang pag-uusapan natin dito, di ba? Mm -hmm. And and it's really about the the owner. So, I mean, what do you think? There will always be that vulnerability, especially almost by definition, among the biggest players in, and the most influential players in Philippine media. Yes, the 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 thing is, Robbie. In this country, media ownership, I mean, running a media company is an expensive proposition. Uh, it's, it's, it's um, look, uh, you know the numbers by now. Uh, ABS-CBN used to make uh, 50 million a, a day, or we were, we were losing 30 million a day in the time of COVID when uh, we were shut down, right? Um, Magastos ang pagpapatakbo ng isang media company. And um, I don't know who, who had dared uh, operate and uh, run a media company in this country that succeeded. It's mm. always been those who are part of the elite. Mm. And I don't know uh, when or if there will be ever a time when media ownership in the Philippines would really change, when mm. control would really go to, say, a cooperative of yeah. journalists or uh. a trust, yeah. which I is mean, the idea, a la, yeah. a la guardian, that cannot mm. happen here. Mm. I mean, I, I wanted to see. I wanted to see some of that. To Sheila, I want to ask. Sabi nga ni, ni Jing, it may be a pipe dream to ask when that will happen. But I want to ask you, Sheila, because you you have this. Worldview, literally, uh, from yeah. Columbia University, J School. You're involved in media development um, uh, in, in a lot of places. How about the where? Is there a where? Is there a place? Is there a model out there uh, that, that allowed media to, to address this question of not just ownership, but stability and independence uh, for, for, its, uh, for its mainstream media? Well, th there are certainly many models. One is what the public broadcasting or public media model, where you have taxpayer-supported media, like in, in the UK or in the Scandinavian countries, Canada, uh, New Zealand, where you have, pub or even here in the US, public media speaking to a broader audience and ensuring as much inclusion and representation and not beholden to any political power. We don't have that in the Philippines. What we have is a government propaganda channel and a government propaganda machine. Um, so that's one model. Another model is, is independent nonprofit media. You know, The Guardian is one, Le Monde is run by a cooperative. The AP is a cooperative. Mm -hmm. um, the other model, which, which in theory should work, which is you know, basically the US model, that you have a plurality of media owners representing a plurality of views 
that mm. are privately owned, therefore independent from government funding. That's that's the theory of, of the US media, but we see the failings now as yeah. the revenue mm. models are collapsing. Mm -hmm. and, and so what we're seeing here is actually families or rich millionaire billionaires buying media like Bezos, the Washington Post, mm. in Utah, the Huntsman family. So we're seeing a, a, a reversal back to, to family owned media. But I think the concept of media as a public trust is, is what is paramount. It's enshrined in constitutions. This is why um, media has power. That's why there is press freedom. It's because you're supposed to be serving the public, right? right. You have constitutionally guaranteed freedoms, not to advance your own interests, but to advance the public interest. It's it's more in, in theory than, than in practice, but certainly there are models around the world. What will, um, what will prevail in the Philippines? I think, you know, to Jing's point, Okay, it's okay to have big media, but I think we should also have small media. Okay. So there's small media has always been a corrective. Okay. All, Commun all community media, PCIJ, uh, all of that, uh, Rappler, have been a corrective to big media. Okay, let me, let me use this to dovetail into a general question of, okay, what do we want to do? natin. And specifically to all of you, here's a question from, uh, is he senator now? Is he... Or let's say citizen Sani Trillanes. A question from Ano. He says, watching. We we'd like to thank everyone for watching. You're on the Ang Docu, and thank you for joining us in this wonderful festival. But here's a question from Mr. Trillanes. In a hypothetical scenario, and I have to say this is a very hypothetical scenario. If the opposition wins in 2022, what public policies should be adopted to address the problems besetting Philippine media and journalism today? I mean, John, what would you like to see by way of legislation? Whether or not the opposition wins, I think it is important for us to realize that it is a mistake to put government power, to put the power to, reg to uh, uh, issue licenses to TV networks in the okay. hands of government. Mm -hmm. uh, so whether the opposition wins or not, that's one of the things that we should be advocating for. Uh, we, we need to look for a different Way of um, ah, sige, sige. That, so, sorry, Jana. Before, para lang hindi ano, I, because I want to get as many suggestions as possible before we dive into the details. Ikaw, Jing, what would you like to see? I mean, John already said, let's of take course. that power out of Congress. Let's take it out. Okay, Dan, what else would you like to see? Mm. Mm. Um, well, John took the words right out of my mouth, you know. Uh, there mm. is really a big question mark in the current practice, in the current law that, uh, you know, gives that power to lawmakers, to politicians, mm -hmm. who are the ones we cover, who are the ones, who are the subjects of critical coverage at times. So you can see the conflict there. Um, aside from that, I think, um, Yes, there should be an encouragement of smaller media companies in this country. Maybe uh, mm, maybe more protection for those who for those journalists out there in the provinces who are vulnerable to mm. uh, you know violence. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, Jim, I wait, Jim, before I know, maybe this will prompt you also. And let me throw this in. This is from Weng Paraan, former chairperson of NUJP. Hi, Weng. Thank you. But she raises a very important point. Um, uh, of course, uh, that, you know, all of us are Manila-centric. We all come from the, the city, every major organization <laughs> here. She points out, let's not forget, this is our first time with a mayor. But... The, the community journalists, the provincial journalists deal with real mayors every day as well. Na PPI silang lahat araw-araw. They have to, and it's a totally different dynamic where you, when you're in your hometown, in the same neighborhood as the police and, the, and, the, and so on. So just throwing that in, among other things that you would like to see by way of policy, how do we uh, raise uh, not only the protection, but also yeah. the viability of community of community <laughs> voices as well. Jim, what 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 would you like to suggest? Yeah, no, uh, I, I just want to briefly go back to the issue of ownership no, of the in the in the local media industry. I think that, that that's really a very weak spot of the industry. 
uh, we've seen how Marcos, you know, exploited that weakness uh, of his political nemesis. So at that time, we were covering, you know, you, you, everyone knows how people resorted to, you know, looking for foreign news and, you know, mm. copying this, this, this news reports about uh, the shenanigans of the Marcos administration. And, uh, you know, it, it happened again, like, like in the case of ABS-CBN. But I think that the, the, there are some things that have changed. No, uh, the the media in this country used to be a, a contained space. No, it, it, it literally it's owned by the big net networks. And, but now you have social media. You have Facebook. You know they close ABS-CBN. Where is ABS-CBN now? It did not give up. Still reporting online. Where where what is the platform of Rappler? It's it's social media. So. Uh, but 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 I think there have to be improvements in uh, in you know in in the way that 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 medium that medium is used. No, so yeah, it's there, there are a lot of opportunities. There are a lot of uh, choice. Uh, there are more options now than 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 what has happened before under Mark Marcos. Yeah, Rob? Maria. Mar yeah, I'll go ahead, John. Yeah, no, I wanted to put uh, very quickly on the table uh, other reforms that we can look for, or that we can advocate would be, well, to continue advocating for decriminalization of libel, mm -hmm. uh, which is a potent weapon mm -hmm. in the hands of the unscrupulous, uh, and also to, uh, to you know, there, there, there is a law that, uh, 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 that mandates the, um, uh, what is this, media and information literacy module I think for grade 11, but mm. uh, what has happened is that it's, it's, uh, it's really more of like, you know, uh, it's, not, it's not about the news cycle, it's not about the news process at all. So if, can, if that can be revisited uh, and, you know, uh, even earlier, uh, not in grade 11, but even earlier, I think that's something that's uh, worth pursuing. Yeah. I'll add, Maria, Sheila, yeah. Yeah, yeah Robbie, I'll, I'll add the um, kind of the pillars, right? I think, and this is something that as, as legislators and, and the judiciary should be looking at is uh, think about what holds up our democracy. And I think the most, this time is really existential. So how do we strengthen all of that? <clears throat> Journalism is only one. I think the first pillar is technology. I mean, my lordy, I keep looking for technology legislation that addresses the fundamental problem. Uh, and, and this is actually connected to social media, right? When the platforms that deliver news actually are prioritized lies laced with anger and hate, that, mm -hmm. that spreads faster and further than facts, the news, right? So you can actually say that the very platforms that are not from the Philippines, these platforms, delivery platforms of news, of information, are biased against facts. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm. that the second thing is journalism. Who speaks truth to power? Who is trained? Who has standards and ethics? Um, you've got to either uh, strengthen. That means allow the business model to survive. The advertising is crumbling. Uh, this is part of the reason, you know, there's, there's an initiative that we're part of. The, uh, it's a, a tr an attempt to try to raise a billion dollars a year to try to fund independent media public uh, globally. Right? Nothing like that in the Philippines. In fact, here it's the other way. Choke them, kill them, squeeze them. Mm. Um, mm. That's journalism. You need facts, right? So first is the delivery of facts is flawed. Where is the legislation to try to protect the public in that, the users, the public sphere? The second is the journalist. You have to not just protect uh, physically, but the business model is dead. So we don't have a public bra. And then finally, the third one, which is critical, is civil society, the NGOs who are there, if they don't have facts, how can they act in the real world? Here's your other part. If you don't have facts, how can you have integrity of markets or integrity of elections? Mm. That's the false, the, you know, that this, um, all the lies that come are actually a, a strategy and a tactic. So civil society, how do you strengthen that? Um, in a time of pandemic, who gets funding Right. Um, there's there's so many things to think about. It's it's a great question. I just hope that we get there from here. Right. Mm. How, how do we get there? Well, from yeah, here? According, according to Mr. Trillanes, the opposition needs to win. <laughs> <laughs> they need to be okay. more organized. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sheila, Sheila, what would you what would you say? Is there is there a simple 
again, looking at models all over the world, has there been a simple uh, turnkey by way of reform that actually you know, led to, wow, simple thing um, uh, it causes uh, really fundamental change? I, I don't think there's a silver bullet because it's, it's such a complex issue. But certainly one thing that can be done is repeal the cyber libel law that's immediate that can be done okay. because that's really, a, that's really a sword hanging over the heads of journalists. But other things that can be done, especially for community media, and I hear when, because community media is really important. And in fact, look, communities, especially the farther you are from Manila, the less well-served you are in terms of media. I think there should be some effort, I don't know, maybe rural banks or PNB or DBP. You know, all they've done in these banks have done in the past was to provide BS loans to cronies of government. Why can't there be a loan facility that is, you know, very low interest that will be open mm. to small entrepreneurs and there can be a cap on what kind of, and maybe there should be prioritized media cooperatives that can then get soft loans to be able to set up media businesses. And there mm. should be some, you know, accompanying training and other things for them. There can be like a rescue, a rescue fund, like we rescue industries that are mm. under threat. And certainly the media is a threatened industry, but right. the rescue, not the big players, but the small ones and the new ones, because, you know, why should you rescue, you know, dying news organizations? I think we need to provide an environment where we can see new news organizations. So money is one, but certainly the freedom to operate is, is, is another third, you know, support in terms of training, use of technology, et cetera. But let's also not forget the audience because yes. the audience has to, the audience has to see the full play of the internet, not just Facebook. And mm. this is why I think Wi-Fi connectivity, Robbie, <laughs> is important. Oh, no. uh, uh, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi uh, to um, you know, mm. to Mr. Well, Pangilinan. Oh, oh. What cheap Wi-Fi available? And maybe there should be like public hotspots or public mm. libraries because that's mm. what we need: are places mm. where people can congregate and consume media that's not just. Facebook, because Facebook mm. is free, or yeah. maybe subsidize, you know, things like the Ang Docu. You know, that's the, the subsidies for independent documentaries have been great. Maybe there should be subsidies, similar subsidies for independent media or education projects. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah. In lieu of a public broadcasting system, some sort of a public journalism fund. Yes, yes. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Now, John, I wanted to talk about something. I mean, this is pretty big uh, reform. It's multi-generational. You talked about the audience, as, as Sheila pointed out. We need. I mean, we can't let this generation and the next just keep growing up in this environment where they can't tell the facts from from fiction. I've always said that you know one virtue of a generation that doesn't know what to believe should be that they shouldn't believe anything. Right. I mean, it's, it's I think we were all brought up in a generation where if it's in black and white, but that's the term, but it's in black and white. Therefore, it must be true. I think this this next generation should be taught from the start that no, no, no. Start from a premise that you will not believe anything right until you know what to look for. Maybe that will bring up brass. But anyway, this is about you. I want to ask you, John, and all of you, how do we make a resilient population, an information, not just literate population, but an information resilient population. Uh, first, I think we need to make a distinction between skepticism, which we should encourage, and cynicism, which we should discourage. So this whole notion that we, we cannot believe anything, that doesn't really work in real life. Um, there are certain things that you need to take on faith, that you need to take based on how you assess a person's credibility. Uh, but what we need to do is to uh, develop this habit of skepticism, uh, especially when it comes to life or death issues, you know, very important matters. You need to, uh, to weigh it. Uh, and I think that um, it's, it's important now we are beginning to speak in terms of uh, fostering critical thinking. That's, mm -hmm. that's fine, right? We, we talk about cognitive biases and so on. But I think it's also important, and I, I think Maria will... Uh, we'll have some something to say about this, that be, because social media is actually based on uh, largely on an appeal to the non-rational part, to emotion, we must have some sort of, for lack of a better term, critical feeling uh, type of uh, skills building, right? So, you know, um, I, I was in, I, 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 I was at, the, uh, I hosted a, a forum uh, 
a, a few weeks ago on martial law. And there was someone from uh, the Ilocos region who asked, uh, aside from the murder and the greediness of Marcos, what, you know, what else can you say about him? In other words, looking for the positive things. And then in the discussion, she said, and out of, I think, you know, uh, genuine sincerity saying, well, yeah, we hear that, but, right? And, and, and if I had been present in that particular forum, I would have come in and say, and said, we should be skeptical about our butts. Okay, why, why do we say, uh, why can't we just uh, uh, accept that uh, there are some people who uh, on, on balance have done more bad than good? Mm. And part of the reason why we can't accept that is because we have some perhaps unexamined assumptions. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, the young idea that critical thinking matched with, uh, for lack of a better term, critical feeling might be a way of... Uh, Getting yeah. at the problem. I, I, uh, Jing, how do we how do we address the, the well? It is a problem, um, not necessarily their fault, but how do we address that problem on the side of the audience? They're getting they're spoiled for Facebook and they're spoiled for content fed to them by algorithms and therefore by definition by their own biases and the interests of their friends. They create their own bubbles and. There is that, as I said, that, 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 that syndrome that they cannot, they don't know how to consume news. They don't have that critical thinking. What can we do? It, it's, it's a, you know, Robbie, it's a failure both of the education system and the media itself. Mm. I, I am uh, quite passionate about this idea because... Uh, you know, we were, when we weren't looking, the education curriculum just drastically changed. Uh, nawala ang history, for instance. It, it, and, and suddenly, we were shocked that there was hardly any mention of martial law in history books for elementary and high school students or that uh, the the story or the, the portion about the EDSA revolution was just a little more than a page or, or even less in some cases. We weren't looking. We didn't know that that was changed or we probably were busy with other yep. news events, right? Yep. And yep. then the other thing is media itself. Media fed our audience too much entertainment. We're guilty of that, and, and I'm, this may not be a popular uh, uh, observation to some of my colleagues, but I do believe our audience is over-entertained and under-informed, mm. and that is the thing that we need to change. Okay. Jim, you wanted to say something. Yeah, no. Uh, actually, I, I, I wanted to draw a question to Sheila, if, if I may, Robbie. Yeah, of course. So, yeah. Uh, Sheila is in is in a, in a good in a, is in a very good vantage. No? So I wanted to ask I wanted to ask you, Sheila, what what do you think and how would you compare the pushback between the Philippine media and the the U.S. media on 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 leaders that are you know the, the different dynamics, but they have a lot of similarities. What are the weaknesses and the pitfalls that you see? Where can improvements be made? Well, the, the problem of this information, as I said, is global. And certainly here, especially now during the US elections, there's massive disinformation. And you have you know, big, really well-resourced media org organizations trying to fight back by calling out lies. You know, they said mm -hmm. President Trump said a lie or putting a lot of things in context. That's what you know, the Washington Post, that's what the New York Times does, that's what some of the big networks do. They say, they outright, like, which I don't see in the Philippine press when Duterte says something yeah. that's a lie, nobody's putting that in context. So they're all of this, you know, trying to put much more context and interpretation in the news rather than the flat news reporting. There was a recent study by, in, by um, some Harvard you know, people like Lok Yokai Benkler where they looked at this information regarding these elections. And they actually said, you know, one last bulwark against this information in the US is the media, especially, and you will like this, Jim, especially the AP, 
<laughs> which is, you know, because media is polarized all, all, all over the US, but the AP feeds by giving fact-based information to local newspapers and local radio stations in local communities, they are able to stanch the flow of this information up to a point. But the yeah. media landscape is totally, un, it's wild, it's, it's yeah. anarchic. And sure, we can do education, but that's, that would be a long time. And I agree with Maria that at some point, regulation is necessary. Facebook, yeah. Twitter, Instagram, they all have to take an active part and we have to re-examine the algorithmic business model upon which these businesses are, are based. I mean, some of that is going to happen probably because there's no antitrust legislation against Google, maybe Facebook will be next, but some of that is happening and the platforms are now doing minor tweaking because they know they're going to be regulated. In the Philippines, we don't have the power to regulate Facebook right or or twitter they um facebook or twitter will intervene if it's a u.s election but they will not intervene probably if it's a philippine election because it's too complicated for them they don't have the knowledge and frankly we don't have we don't have the the consumer power or whatever so we have to do this on our own and it has to be all of us not just journalists but i think culture popular culture plays a huge part in this yeah. um uh, churches schools yeah, maybe, I mean, all of us as citizens have a role yeah yeah let me throw in a question from dean deman hit of strat base uh, group i think you know him uh albert del rosario institute he says what are your proposals for partnerships between media the public sector the business sector and citizens towards creating a more participative democratic environment for that matter you know this is the docu where this is uh, the filmmakers the artists uh, the creatives uh, taking part in this, are we working enough with the other content developers, with the other creatives, with artists, with, with filmmakers, and so on? Uh, Rob, uh, if I may, I'll take uh, the first crack at this. Um, one of the things that the private sector can do and civil society can do in partnership with uh, the media community is to precisely fund those uh, small shops the community newspapers or news organizations uh, that we've been talking about. So for instance, Minda News has been doing terrific work mm. over the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, but its finances, as far as I can uh, understand them, uh, are, you know, I guess more hit and miss, hit or miss. Mm. Uh, but it, it would be wonderful if uh, like a public journalism fund, quote unquote, can be set up to fund their journalism or, you know, going to the North, Northern Dispatch or Zon <coughs> CLTV uh, with Sonia Soto. I mean, there are, there are specific examples uh, of this. And I think that's one way that uh, these, uh, uh, the private sector and the civil, and civil society can uh, help our fellow journalists. Can I add and just tie John and Sheila together? Um, so so uh, I think we, we still kind of think that news organizations are powerful. We keep forgetting that that power, which came from gatekeeping, has been stripped from us and is now with technology. And point. so that's why I, I say we, we, we fight impunity on two fronts right now. You know, we're, we're trying to demand accountability of the government as we are trying to demand accountability of Facebook, of, of the platforms that give our things. So, so I would say just two things. You know, um, we need to look, tell our public that when you go on social media, that you are being manipulated. And it's not pro-Duterte or anti-Duterte. It is the platform itself that manipulates you. It's insidious. Everything you put in, if you guys haven't seen Social Dilemma, watch. Mm -hmm. You know, everything you put in creates a model of who you are that is more accurate than anything you can say. And then all of that, your behavior is sold. Your most vulnerable moment to a message can be sold to a company or a government. And that artificial intelligence that pulls that together keeps that loop going, right? So we are insidiously manipulated. The one that the strongest force in the Philippines is the pro-Duterte state-sponsored propaganda. And that affects the way we see reality. So how do you fight that? How does civil society fight that? 
You help fund the truth tellers and their journalists, their documentary filmmakers. You help us survive. You have the courage to stand up and call a lie a lie uh, and put context. We have to collaborate. Sorry, I'll, you know, those, so really yeah. easy, easy things, right? <laughs> yeah, Sheila, I know, I know Sheila, PCIJ went into this, you know, what are the other forms of storytelling? How do we collaborate with musicians, with rappers? How do we collaborate with even uh, children's book illustrators? I remember your project uh, on Kian de los Santos, rendered as a children's book. What other collaborations do you think we should be exploring? I think there's a lot of collaborations we can do, particularly with, you talk about private business. You know, a lot of this, a lot of the private schools now are owned by business houses. And mm. certainly we could, we could work with them on doing educational products. And, and um, I, I think there's a lot of creativity out there. It's just that we haven't had opportunity. Maybe we should have a sort of, uh, meetups and matchups where we can brainstorm and work on things together because I think mm -hmm. the artists are very eager to work with journalists and the journalists have sort of been very constrained by the format of journalism and news that maybe we can have this you know interesting collaborations if, if we work together and we should just think of of news and journalism as information as a continuum rather than this is what journalists do and this is what artists do, and this is what communities do. Um, a lot of, for, for example, here, some investigative reporting centers have mounted theater plays based on, based on their reporting. They, they, I mean, documentaries are having a heyday. So thank you, Kara, for putting the Angdoki together, but certainly the documentary form is very effective form in terms of explaining complex issues that the news format because of the length, because of you know various constraints, is is not able to do. Yes, we 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 can do it, but we have to mm -hmm. find a point where we can meet and work together and some money to make those collaborations possible. Mm -hmm. Jing, what's happening to the people, the eleven thousand who lost their oh. jobs? And where are they? Where do they take their energy if they still have the energy? I mean, we can understand if, you know, they need a break. I mean, it's, it's really something else. But I know there are initiatives as well. I know that there is a spark in journalists that's very hard to kill. What's happening to give us some ideas on where people are channeling their energies now? Well, uh, as you know, um, yeah, we've had several waves of uh, layoffs already. Uh, about half of the 11,000 have lost their jobs, Robbie. Um, some of them, uh, you know where they went. Uh, some of them are with TV5 now. Um, and yet uh, there are some who couldn't find a job in journalism or in the news uh, organizations uh, that are still around. So I, I, I think uh, it's also very evident now that uh, a lot of our former colleagues uh, are putting up their, you know, small businesses. Mm. Uh, the pandemic has certainly helped uh, create bakers and chefs and cooks and uh, entrepreneurs among us. And so that's where they are. Uh, however, uh, the journalists that we've had to let go mm. are, are still mostly you know, taking a break uh, for now, for a few months maybe, and are intent on finding uh, work in the mm -hmm. same field. Uh, I think they just, well, it was a very traumatic experience for all of us. And so many just needed some time to, you know, get their bearings together and, and yeah. recover. Uh, but yes, uh, many would still want to do journalism. Um, there are some who went to uh, a few who went to the government station or uh, public relations, in fact. So mm. it yeah. is what it is. They, they need to uh, feed their families and, and uh, make a living. Yeah. Jim, you have a question for uh, Jing. Uh, yeah, Jing, uh, since we're on ABS CBN, uh, I, uh, I wanted to ask you, you know, in, in, the, in the office where I sit, where I work in, the, in our newsroom, 
there's a wall that's dedicated to flat TVs. You know, all the, we monitor all the networks uh, with all the radio stations blaring. But you know, and and uh, uh, I would like to say that ABS-CBN has been one of the most useful in 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 my work. So now it's gone. I think with the closure of ABS-CBN, it, it's one of the most massive information blackouts or outages that I've seen in my life as a journalist. Huh? So what I want to ask is, it hasn't been quantified, but how much of a, an information blackout or information hmm. vacuum has been created by the closure of uh, ABS-CBN? I know that I, I talk with your, some of your people that you know you use satellites that can reach places you know even beyond the, the line of sight beyond mountains, and you're the mm -hmm. only one who can do that. I ask this on because of two concerns: impunity, you know, darkness, lack of yes. information and in media, you know, posters, impunity. And we're going to 2022. There's a lot of information blackout, and the only narrative that people will hear in a lot of places would be the government narrative. So how massive is this blackout? Um, you could say that um, 60 million or 69 million Filipino viewers every month uh, no longer see ABS-CBN on their free-to-air uh, channels. That's how massive the... Uh, that's how bad uh, our reach uh, has been diminished badly. Uh, in, in many parts of the country, uh, there are people who complain when there are, whenever there are typhoons that they never really get uh, updated information or storm warnings even. Uh, our own reporters are witnesses to this uh, in, in Aurora or in uh, parts of Quezon. Uh, parts of uh, Panay Island down to, you know, places like Agusan. Uh, ABS-CBN is being missed by ordinary folks who can't afford uh, data, uh, who can't afford to watch our news programs on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, it's, we are now, uh, we now have a block time arrangement with uh, Channel 11, with the uh, Zoe TV. Mm -hmm. But as you know, there is no news program in that arrangement. Um, mm -hmm. We have our, we still operate our news uh, channels, uh, ANC and Teleradio, but we've had to, uh, you know, compress our programming. Uh, mm -hmm. We used to be 24 seven and now we sign off at 10 p.m. Uh, mm -hmm. Part of our cost cutting because we can't be uh, the same, can't operate the same way we used to. And of course, uh, our current affairs has been shut down totally. Only TV Patrol is uh, mm. airing on prime time. And that's not even really airing because it's streaming only and is on cable. Okay. So uh, that's how massive. The TV Patrol used to make up to 15 million pesos a day. Now we only make maybe a million on a good day in advertising revenues. Okay. We'll get That's how massive to... the impact mm. of the shutdown mm. is to, mm. to our journalists and to us, mm. to our producers. We, uh, we only were able to do uh, a couple of documentaries this year. Uh, I had to stop uh, the team from working on, on any, mo any other documentary, in fact. Mm. So mm. there is that. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll get into all of this uh, some more. We're mm -hmm. actually running uh, we're actually running overtime at this point, but we'll stay on for another uh, 15 minutes. We'll see how we, sure. show it, we feel. In, but in the meantime, Maria does have to go. Uh, so Maria, I'll let you have one final message. But I, I, if you don't mind, I want to prompt you. Uh, because I remember having breakfast with Sheila. I was, I was, I was meeting with young reporters uh, from various groups, just from many organizations. And they had this sense now, you know, what, what should we do? What, what do you think we should be doing? They were looking to journalists of our generation asking us, what did you do before? And what do you think we, should, we, we can be doing now? What do you think, Maria, we should be doing now? I mean, something that we can, let's make this a productive uh, 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 a Zoom, right? What, what can we do? 
so many things. So the first, I guess, is, uh, is just understand this is it. If we don't do our jobs, if we don't do more, democracy as we know it will die. This is where we're headed, right? Um, number two, what Jing said, what happened to ABS-CBN, she only quantified the impact right now, but we're just starting to look at all the data. There is a cultural, like, like it's almost like an, ah, a mushroom cloud afterwards because the first part that she talked about is just the creation of the, of the information and content that reaches people. But then afterwards, all of the other, the, like the star magic ball not happening, right? What does that do? Um, that has an impact on advertising, that has an impact on the economy. So those are other things are there. So existential for democracy, for journalists. And then I think the last part is, you know, I, I take a, a page out of the real Facebook oversight board. It's a group of 25 people who came together. And uh, this is Shoshana Zuboff who wrote the, Re the Age of Surveillance Capitalism. She's a Harvard professor emerita. She studied the business model that is now really turning our world upside down. This is an emergency intervention. So what can you do? Everything you can think of. This is the moment, this is it, right? If we, let's go back to what the values are. Filipino showed the world exactly how important democracy is. And it triggered movements all around the world. So I guess the question here is, you know, we have to ask ourselves the question of how important are the values of democracy? How important are facts? And mm. then we have to come together and actually do something about it now. Mm. Okay. Maraming salamat, Maria Reza. Nice to see and... you guys again. <laughs> Thank Maraming... you. Bye, Maria. <laughs> Maraming salamat. Now, before we continue... Ako po humihingi ng paumanhin. We have, we have this one comment. Just to acknowledge the comment, it's, we're heading mm. into the home stretch of this discussion. But uh, Robert Alejandro, among other people, then Timothy Dulgime are saying, but kayo English ng English, magtagalog din naman kayo. And, and really, but I want to acknowledge this also. Hindi naman po sa kaya ko magtagalog dire um, and, 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 and all of our panelists. But on the one hand, this is an issue for for media, di ba? Parang uh, a lot of mainstream media is in fact in English. On the on the other hand, Jing, in, in, in everybody's defense, you look at the most powerful voices uh, being broadcast out there. ABS-CBN did make a very conscious uh, 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 pioneering effort and very deliberate decision to go Tagalog. I remember when all newscasts were in, were in English. But let's talk about that. And by way of picking up also on the impact of having lost the regional mm. stations and the regional news programs of ABS-CBN. Just talk a bit uh, quickly about the importance of understanding and meeting our audience where they are and speaking uh, in the language that they do. Um, yeah, uh, that was really uh, a big part of the concept of uh, Building Bridges on the Air by uh, the late Capitan Henny Lopez, Robbie. Um, it was very successful. We put up regional stations in um, many areas in the provinces from Luzon to Mindanao. And, and uh, uh, for a time, we had more than 20 uh, local TV patrols. Of course, uh, cost cutting and, and other efficiency issues uh, forced us to cut down on them uh, in, in recent years. However, the, the usefulness and the value of those local TV patrols could not be discounted. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, with the shutdown, of course, we had to close down those stations. Uh, we had to lay off uh, most of the people who worked in the regions. Uh, but, but here is the thing, no? Uh, sabi mo nga, talagang nandoon yung kagustuhan. Once a journalist, always a journalist. And they can't really turn their backs on their communities. And what they're doing now is continuing, some of them are continuing to put up uh, uh, Facebook accounts uh, so that they can still continue to deliver news to their communities. Uh, for our part in, uh, in the Manila headquarters, um, 
we engaged uh, these uh, regional reporters as uh, freelance contributors so that uh, they still get to file stories about their communities and the rest of the country can still see, can still watch uh, uh, those stories. So, hindi namin uh, gusto na talagang mawala yung aming provincial and regional coverage, kaya naman uh, pinagpapatuloy namin. Of course, iba na ang terms ng uh, engagement kapag ganyan, ano, kung freelancer ka, alam ito ni Jim sa AP at uh, John also, uh, we, we are used to dealing with uh, freelancers, hindi ba? But kahit pa paano nakakatulong yan, uh, para ipagpatuloy nila ang kanilang journalism. And at the same time, uh, hindi mawala yung mga balita ng gagaling sa mga probinsya, Robbie. Okay. Kasi lang gusto kong balikan yung iga nga, di ba? You remember that. Nag-uusap tayo. You were tall, telling me about all of these young journalists and they want to help, they want to fight, they want to push back. But they start with a very, very basic question. Well, and it was really in the context of organizing. I mean, that was the mm -hmm. sense that I got. So even short of organizing, just getting together. They, uh, you know, among other things, uh, you know, in Daya Spina Barona uh, and, uh, and uh, Weng Paraan and JJ Jimeno, we've gotten together maybe three times during, during COVID uh, just for donuts and coffee. And it was basic, it was very, very, it was just a time to get together and exhale and kwentuhan lang. But there was real value there knowing that we all knew why we needed to exhale. That Chin, I wanted to get back to that original idea that, that you had. I mean, what can we do in terms of just getting together and really rebuilding and reassuring this community? So, Kamini na John, Neri, Sina Weng, and, and other people, we met with si Howie, Severino, si GMA. We started meeting with mga young journalists from, from all over, um, print, broadcast, web. Uh, actually, birthday namin yun ni, <laughs> tatlo kaming may birthday nun, and we said, um, sige, uh, we will treat you an, around, John, mga 80, no? Mga 18 dumating doon sa very, very crowd. 16 dumating doon sa very crowd. Tapos tinanong nila, anong kinuha niyo noon nung panahon, panahon niyo? Talagang matanda na kami. Ang, ang isang sinabi namin, alam mo noon, pagkatapos ng deadline, pupunta kami sa press club. That's right. uh, tapos uh, inom kami ng San Miguel beer, isang beer lang noon. Uh, kakain kami at magkukwentuhan kami yung mga matat mas matanda sa amin, kami mga bata, mak makikinig kami. Tapos panahon yun ni Marcos, nagrabe yung censorship, lalong-lalo na pagka pagkatapos nung assassination ni Niloy Aquino. Tapos talagang heart-to-heart -heart na pag-uusap. Natatandaan ko pa, sabi nung isang editor sa akin, editor siya nun ng Daily Express, sabi niya, alam mo yung anak ko, kinahihiya niya na ang tatay niya. Grabe yung censorship, lalo na ng Marcos Control Press. So talagang over a bottle of beer, mag kayo, pero you build community that way, solidarity, um, and knowing each other and building trust. So hmm. ngayon kasi, ang traffic ng Metro Manila, ang hirap na mag magkita-kita sa isang lugar, tapos may, may COVID pa. Pero ang alam ko na dyan, nagtuloy sila no bago nitong covid nagtuloy sila nang nag, nagkikita kasi nung bumalik ako nung nung last christmas na, nagpunta pa ako doon sa isang meeting nila minsan mag-share sila ng pizza or kung saan-saan mm -hmm. pero mag, mag maganda yon lalong-lalo na pag yung mas matatanda at saka yung mga bata nagsasama-sama at, at nag-uusap at nag-share kahit walang konkretong kinalabasan oh. I think parang we are a tribe, right? So we have mm. we have to get together and, and be oh, speaking of that speaking of that tribe, yeah. I want to give the young people an idea here because they can't picture it. They literally cannot picture it. But before, I remember not even hindi lang sa periodista. Tanda ko kahit sa mga estudyante, pagka mag kayo sa sa ano, sa harap ng ng US Embassy or kung saan man sa Manila, ang isang basic na usapan, kung ma disperse tatakbo tayo sa National Press Club. Tapos napakalaking bagay nun. No? It, it created this image of may sandigan ka. Merong nasa likod mo. And that's the press. That's the media. Uh, now, I won't get into anong nangyari sa National Press Club. Pero Jim, I do want to get into 
how do we bring back yung yung yan yung 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 saysay na pagiging isang komunidad, isang tribo gaya nga na sabi ni ni Sheila. Ay, oo, napakadaling mag-Zoom. This is a b- very big thing. Maraming salamat sa daang docu. Madaling mag-chat, madaling gumawa ng mga Viber group and so on. Pero ano pa yung anong gusto mong mangyari? Or even a simple suggestion on what can we do in terms of getting together, literally getting together. Yeah. Uh, Robbie, in my mind, uh, I think there's a crucial need for all efforts, you know, like like what Sheila's done a long time ago, to to be institutionalized and expanded and, and sustained. No? You know, uh, Gabi Tabunyar and uh, uh, Teddy Benigno, founded the FOCAP, no, Foreign Correspondents Association of the Philippines, in 1974, nearly 50 years ago, because they didn't want to be the whole, uh, you know, umbrella holders of Imelda Marcos. No? They, they wanted independence. And Sheila founded PCIJ in, was it 1989, Sheila? 89, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, you know, Maria and her friends, Glenda and Chai, started Rappler 2011-2012. So, so look at the longevity. Look at what they're doing now. Look at the pushback. Look at the, look at the, you, you know, potential of these networks of, you know, safety net uh, networks. You 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 can use this network to to bring in trainings to reporters in the communities, you know, interactions, discussions, you know, things like this. So I think it's very important to to institutionalize. Mm. And John, can I, report, yeah, you, you have, we have to institutionalize and to make it long-lasting and organized. Mm. John, pakisabi nga, kailan ba birthday mo? Para pwede tayo magtipon-tipon ulit. Hindi ako yun, si Nashila yun. I'd like to join the conversation. First, a uh, 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 few quick descriptions of reality. Yes, uh, I think that the young ones have uh, continued to meet. Uh, uh, that's first. Second, uh, I follow many of them on social media, and it seems like even up to now, uh, they, they, there is a sense of solidarity or uh, 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 a common spirit that you can trace. I mean, you know, that uh, maybe it's just uh, I'm just mis- uh, uh, misreading it, but I actually think that uh, their uh, relationships are developing. And third, there are certain things like. Uh, the campus journalism group started by uh, Regine Cabato, Washington Post reporter mm. from the Philippines. <clears throat> they, they've reached, I think they've had three or four workshops with uh, campus journalists uh, who would like to make a career out of journalism. So you have these uh, uh, in- initiatives uh, going on. Uh, so, so, so there is that. Uh, but uh, one of the things that we can do well, it would be great if we can have a publication or an, an organ, news organization where we can do collaborative journalism. Wouldn't it be great if we have, for instance, a magazine where a GMA reporter and a, an APS-CBN reporter work on the same story, share a byline? I mean, that sort of uh, collaborative journalism will go a long way, will encourage uh, others to also share. I mean, you, you have to admit, even up to today, there's, there's still uh, too many yeah. boundaries. Uh, mm. corporate boundaries that we have to observe uh, even among friends. So that's that's one thing that I would really like to see happen. Yeah, but, uh, but even among the two friends here, Inquirer, for example, and ABS-CBN, are there those restrictions to your journalists to collaborating with somebody else from another company? Uh, for some reason, it was never... Uh broached or or pursued no mm. uh, but i don't really think there are mm. restrictions ako, i mean wala really naman talagang eh. bawal ah. diba hmm. but I, I, I think Robbie, ang mahirap lang talaga yung media solidarity it's it's really really hard to achieve mm. uh, in the philippine uh, setting um, mm. i guess it's the competition uh, that that was prevalent before, but now uh, I don't know. Are we still uh, in competition with the with the mainstream uh, media organizations? I'm not sure. I think we are still in competition. I think the real question is: Can we get together on the big things? Can we get together mm-hmm. on on the things that really confront all of us at an existential level? What What do you think, uh, Sheila and Jim? 
I, I think it's a very narrow view to think that we are each other's competitors because um, the, comp- the real competition out there are the armies of disinformation and mm-hmm. propaganda. Exactly. And if you, if you look at the numbers of journalists all around the world, including here in the US, um, PR people outnumber journalists already. I'm sure that's the case in the Philippines also. If you take all the PRs and the communications people, there are more of us. We are really, it's really an asymmetrical fight and that does not include the paid trolls and the people doing this information and the, and the sort of semi-clandestine um, PR operations, especially during, during campaigns. So the real competition actually is not among ourselves as journalists, the real competition are the people out there who want to, um, you know, manipulate manipulate the news and manipulate public opinion. Right? Mm. So I, I, we should we should we should reframe our, our thinking in terms of competition. Mm. Yeah. The real competition are the parlades and the partosas of this world, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I I, I did want to say, John. I mean, yeah. ako rin, yun perception ko that actually people mm. assume, diba? But but I have actually have yet to hear of somebody suggesting I want to initiate, maybe for lack of that initiative. But I didn't get that sense. Now, as you know, uh, plugging, as you know, I have, I've created a podcasting group. But I, from the very start, I knew that one uh, thing that Puma Podcast can provide is a platform that nobody sees as a competition because nobody else is doing it. Diba? And therefore, when mm. we create it, by definition, we're a friend. We're a platform to everyone. And as you know, John, we, we, we produce the podcast for Inquirer. Sure. Uh, now yeah, sure. we produce our own investigative podcast on um, on on the war on drugs. I would please encourage everyone, please listen to Tokhang sa Tokhang on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or kung wherever you podcast. But here's the point: for that for that uh, for that project, a six-parter investigative podcast on the war on drugs, Tokhang sa Tokhang. We spoke with journalists from from all over the media sector and nobody said to us eh teka muna hindi tayo ano eh, eh parang magkaiba tayo ng company everybody was just in on the mission of telling a story yeah that's that's not what i meant uh, rob I, i meant uh, like sharing bylines actually working mm-hmm. on something together uh, the, part of the reason is because bef- uh, we, we don't really have like a columbia journalism review where uh, uh, yeah We can we we can all see as common or neutral ground, but I, I really like the way you uh, have put together the Puma podcast uh, group. So that might be uh, a common ground uh, for us to work together. So, for instance, instead of just one newspaper uh, looking at their archives uh, at uh, their coverage of a particular controversy, you can have two or three reporters from that mm-hmm. time uh, mm-hmm. talking about their experience covering that particular uh, controversy. Uh, Rob, I, let me just say this though that uh, uh, the, the the meeting that we had, the first meeting that we had with the young journalists, uh, one of the main reasons for uh, convening that was to discuss uh, what we could do. It wasn't for them; it wasn't mm. an opportunity for the younger ones to ask us. In mm. fact, it was the exact opposite. What we wanted to happen was uh, we we wanted to let people know that. While some of the problems look the same, the conditions are different. And perhaps what we need are digital social media natives like them to actually oh. show the way. Now, oh. the, the, the person behind Editors of Manila was, must have been there. So I, let me just look through my list of the names. Uh, and he misunderstood us. And he, he oh. tweeted that the, older, uh, the old guard was uh, leaving it up to the young ones to figure out a way and that really misrepresents uh, the mm. interaction. I mean, it really, we might have ideas, mm. but who knows? They might have better ideas about how to resolve all, all of this. I mean, we need an AOC mm. to think of a game changer like get out the vote on Twitch mm. by playing Among Us. I mean, that will never, uh, that would never have occurred to me. Rob, uh, you know, it's 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 really it's really uh, it's really for the likes of uh, Regine Cabato, uh, uh, Lian Buan, uh, Mike Navali. <coughs> mm. Okay, Jim, what do you think we should be? What what do you, what do you think we can we can do? 
Um, and by way of bridging this this generation as well, I, I don't know. I don't necessarily think John, you're suggesting there's a generation gap uh, there. Uh, but but Jim, how do we how do we bring the strengths uh, and the experience of the old guard? Let's call it. Let's call us that. And 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 the new uh, the new vanguards of, of journalism. We've been talking about collaborating across sectors. Let's talk about coming together as uh, across generations. Yeah, you. Um, I think uh, th there is a lot of uh, potential no, in, in in the transfer of, if you may call it, technology transfer uh, across divides. No, in, in the media industry, you have you know you have a. Uh, uh, journalists based in Metro Manila in the urban centers that have a lot of access to a lot of things, uh, tutorials and everything. So you now, now that we've discovered uh, the potentials of Zoom, you know, linking up, and even if we return to normal, there, there can be a hybrid of, you know, keep communicating between, communications between the, the, our colleagues in, in the provinces and those in Metro Manila. I think hmm. there's a lot of potential for technology transfer. I would, I would think that Sheila has been doing this in the past. You know, a lot of materials for investigative journalism. You know, theories about journalism, new trends in in Columbia University, which is the the best school for journalists in the world. And what if we can get that, you know, to cross from Sheila to us and to a lot more in in our veterans colleagues in the countryside. In the AP, we, 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 we're, our job is pretty much set. set no? we, we, I, I can't think of a, what collaborations we're doing, but we have stringers and, you know, like in the AP newsroom, we have very good books about, you know, writing and, and uh, writing style, writing principles. And I, I've shared this with, with a lot of uh, our media friends, no? and, and they're really great materials. I think, yeah, the, the, there can be a harnessing of these networks. No? Uh, Jim, uh, if I may ask, uh, Rob, if I may ask Jim, uh, would you in AP be open to, for instance, serving as a mentor to a young journalist or even a campus journalist? By mentoring, I mean like working on a particular story. So you can you, you see it develop from uh, the pitch all the way to the finished product, which will be published elsewhere, not not uh, through AP. Is that something that uh, is uh, legally open to you? Yeah, uh, in, in, yeah. In AP, we have a steward stewardship uh, program. It's formal. It's quite uh, complicated, but I'm I'm really open to to talking to people, learning from them as well, and. Uh, you know, Manny Mogato is a professor in one of the journalism schools in Manila. That's right. You know, he 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 sends his like one class load of students, journalism students, often uh, before COVID, in, to AP and I think to the other wire agencies. So we we tour them around. We give them a, a lay of the of the office, the things that we do. You know, particular situations. Uh, you know. Of course, they always ask us. No, the the first question always is how much is the salary in the AP. So, <laughs> so but yeah, but we we're we're open. You know, Filipinos, uh, including journalists, are a very generous lot. So they we share a lot. We compete. You know, Manny and my friend Jason. You know, we're very good friends, we, we, we share a lot of things and we share to others, we, in, you know, in very hard coverages that we've done in Mindanao, the, the front lines and in, during Typhoon Yolanda, I really appreciated, you know, going beyond the com competition lines and sharing things and resources. And much so, I, I want to see more of that, uh, you know, cooperation and, exchanges between the, the urban-based, NCR-based journalists and our community mm -hmm. reporters. Mm -hmm. Okay, and certainly I think that's the, that's the thing. Right? I mean, after this, tomorrow when we wake up, hopefully there is that, that thinking, oh, man, why don't we just get together? And let's see, usap yeah. lang, kape lang, di ba? Oh, or, or beer lang, kung sino man, kung kanina man tumapat yung birthday, di, mm. thank you na lang. 
Diba? But we're about to wind down. I want to end with that. Sheila, I mean, how do we, what, what would each and every one of you want to see? Starting tomorrow, I mean, I, what are, what's a small thing that we can do? Not something big like asking for, you know, but because we've tackled a lot of big things already. But let's end with something small from each of you. What's one small thing we can do to help Philippine journalism? Um, I, I think for me, it's new forms of storytelling um, that will help advance, you know, people's knowledge and information. So I think if we host, we've hosted meet, you know, meeting journalists are already meeting together, maybe journalists and some artists meeting together on potential collaborative projects. Okay, John? Uh... I was going to say something, but I forgot. Um, I lost my train of thought. Um, so maybe, maybe a better memory for the old guard. Uh, can you get back to me, Rob? You know, Robbie, what struck me uh, these past few months is that media people, journalists like ourselves have become closer somehow. I mean, how many Zoom and webinars have we attended since uh, the pandemic or since the franchise issue of ABS-CBN, di ba? Uh, parang madaming naging karamay ang ABS-CBN and even Rappler in, in our respective uh, issues. And I think uh, journalists have started to realize that it's time we work together or that it's time we started showing real solidarity. The other thing is that um, this crisis that we're facing is forcing us to reinvent ourselves. Madami sa atin. Can you imagine those uh, regional journalists of ABS-CBN banding together to form a group to try to uh, fund their own uh, Facebook news uh, show or YouTube news show, diba? Right? So it, it's, it's fueling reinvention somehow. And I think one small thing that I can do perhaps to help improve our profession is really to continue. Or when I, when I go to the newsroom on Monday, I probably would take stock of the young journalists, the young promising ones in ABS-CBN that I think would be able to help propagate the values, uh, the, best practice, the best practices that we have and, and uh, turn that, turn those into something that we can work on, you know? whether it's a long form program, whether it's a talk show among us, whether it's a regular gathering or a webinar, just so the old guard and the, the young ones, the millennials or the Gen Zs can really work together to, to get us out of this morass. No? Brainstorm, drink, talk. Until, until pigil lang kayo, wag kayo magpapapigil. Go ahead, John. <laughs> yeah, Rob, let's, let's give uh, um, uh, Jim the last word. So I'll, I'll go next. No? Uh, two things. Um, I wish more of us can follow the example of Phil Star News in contextualizing social media posts. They've done this for the last couple of years and they've, been, they've gotten really good at it. Uh, this, this addresses uh, one of the concerns of Sheila uh, that we are able to contextualize, we are able to read contextualized news as news uh, breaks. And the second uh, thing is uh, I'd like more of us to follow the example of Ed Young so if you, if you read Atlantic, Ed Young is probably the best writer in the world right now covering the pandemic. But one of mm -hmm. the, the thing that he practices that really impresses me is that whenever a big article of his comes out, you know, he, would thank, he would thank the editors who worked with him and you know, other reporters. And then he would point out other stories by other journalists belonging mm. to other outlets. And it, it really just develops a wider web. It's like, okay, we're all covering mm -hmm. this thing. This is my take, but you can, you know, please also read A, B, and C. 
Yeah. And uh, that, that would be great uh, if, if we can also do that uh, as a matter of habit. Sure. Perfect. Jim. Rob, for me, it's a message, a very basic message. You, you know, we, we face a lot of threats, libel, and everything, harassment. You know. I think the, the best defense for me, for all the journalists in, in this country, is, is your story. I think the, the, the story should be like, like empirically uh, solid and watertight. And it, it can stand in any court. It can stand any harassment. Uh, it's a guard against uh, fake news. No? So there are a lot of ways to do that. We, 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 we are seeing new generations of journalists. And, and I, I'm very impressed with, with a lot of them. So yeah, and the, the situation hasn't changed. No? The political system, the, let, us, let us cover this country well. You know, the, it, it's, it's a breathtaking country to, to cover the, the conflicts in Mindanao, the potential of Mindanao, you know, and this COVID crisis, you know, at the bottom line really is uh, doing your job well and make every story, like don't, don't release it un unless you're very sure of it. And, uh, you know, imbibe all the, the trainings, the skills that you can. There are a lot of resources now. Filipinos are, journalists are sharing. Uh, the internet is, is, a, is a very good teacher. The streets are a good teacher. You know, there, there, there are still weaknesses in, in, the, in, in, this, in this regard, but really it, it's, I, I've served, I've, I've worked in, in, in Philipp, in the Inquirer, I go, I work with, with the Japanese news agencies and now with, with this Western agency. And yeah, there, 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 there really has to be a major, major effort every time before you put up that story. And you know, in, in relation to that, there has to be an editorial system that can catch any weakness no? and any weak story. You, you know, we, 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 we have our, uh, low low days and weak days, and and it should be caught. So I, I think in in this sense we we are better protected against libel in you know other other forms of harassment because the threats are have always been there. It is here, you know, and it will bury us. No, I I hope not literally. Okay, Rob, if, if I may. Uh, I think it is important for us to focus on questions of craft and professional solidarity. But I think it is equally important to also remember our historical situation. So if you will allow me, I will just repeat what I said earlier, uh, that this is not just another administration. There were problems with Aquino, Ramos, Estrada, Arroyo, Aquino, but none of them turned authoritarian. Duterte is turning authoritarian uh, following the template of Marcos. Uh, I would like to quote uh, the distinguished former journalist and esteemed communications professor, Crispin Maslog, formerly of Ajans France Press. Uh, in a forum on challenging times for journalists, he stood up and said, the president is the challenge. I think we should remember that is our particular historical situation. Okay. Maraming salamat, John. And in the meantime, journalism, however you want to see it, is journalism. The journalists you see around you are the same journalists who are going to be there uh, tomorrow and years from now. I can certainly say that for our friends, our mentors, our models, our idols who joined us in this conversation. I, 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 I was asked once in a, in a, in a forum in a school, na basically the question was, these people that we look up to, what was their journey? How did they get there? And so on. So obviously, I can't answer for everyone, but I can tell you this much. This much is true. They're the ones who are left there. They're the ones there. There were, I can think of a lot of people who were better writers than me, who were better writers than uh, even the people here. I don't think anybody here will take that as a slight to say that there were a lot of people who were better writers than us. But essentially, the people you see, these are the people who stuck it out. These are the people who are still here. These are the people who found it fulfilling and basically just found honor and joy and enjoyment in this craft. We hope you will find that for yourselves too, because that will define not just the state, but the future of journalism 
in the Philippines. And with that, we'd like to thank very much our guests, Sheila Coronel, John Neri, Maria Reza, Jing, uh, and Jim Gomez of, uh, of Associated uh, Press. Maraming salamat to everyone. Thank you, of course, to Kara Magkano Kaligpala and everybody behind the Ang Docu. This is a fantastic platform. Pagpalain po kayo, mabuhay kayo. Please keep it going. And thank you to everyone to tune, who tuned in to our discussion. Maraming pasensya na po na hindi kami nagtagalog. At ano, I mean, I admit that that's a, that's a fault. Um, and that's something that it's a habit that we have to also be conscious of, not just in ourselves, but in this thing that we're trying to do as we connect with our people. A recording of this conversation will be available online. I believe we will be flashing uh, uh, the, the link there. Certainly, you will find it on the Ang Docu. I would also like to thank the students who have been watching, students from De La Salle University, Miriam College, Ateneo University, University of Santo Tomas, University of the Philippines, Diliman, University of the Philippines, Visayas, Mapua University, Cavite State University, Bulacan State University, College of St. Benil, St. Scholastica's College, CEU High School, St. Mary's College, the Journalism Guild of Polytechnic, Polytechnic University of the Philippines, Journalism Guild, uh, San Carlos University, Centro Escolar University High School. Now catch all the documentaries of the Ang Doc U streaming all day until November 5. All of these are free of charge on the Ang Doc U com slash what now para pong tokhang sa tokhang ng Puma Podcast libre rin po yan sa Spotify Apple Podcast Google Podcast no but I'm really very proud of it can I just say can I brag that tokhang sa tokhang our six part documentary series is the first Filipino podcast and as far as we know the first Asian podcast to be curated by the US Library of Congress for inclusion in the podcast preservation project of the US, U.S. Library of Congress. So that is officially there as official resource for research in the future. So please, by all means, let's support each other. Let's support me. Ang dokumentaryo po ay paglalahad ng mga istoryang halaw sa totoo. Pero sa huli, tayo rin at walang iba ang magsusulat ng ating kwento. Ako po si Robo Alampay for Daang Docu. Maramang salamat po for joining Keep Streaming on Daang Docu, the home of Philippine Documentary sa ngalan po ni Kara Magsano Kaligpala. Maraming salamat po. Magandang gabi. Mabuhay po kayong lahat. <laughs>